my microphone yet. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, it's wonderful. All, all is well. Great. Okay. This is WZRD Chicago 88.3 FM. We have with us on WZRD via Zoom, Bill Noti, actor, singer, professional coach, acting coach, performance coach, and also watercolorist, and a host of other um, expertises as well. Bill Noti, welcome to WZRD. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, met, met you at Joni's and um, uh, concert, my original plan, and uh, it's so nice to meet you again and follow up with our uh, lovely conversation then. Yes, absolutely. We were struck when uh, by your performance um, uh, w when we first discovered you. Uh, as for like me, it was uh, listening to you as the priest and the confessional. Uh, but then, of course, uh, at the at the show, uh, the CD release party, we uh, heard you. It was the CD release party. It was um, it was the cabaret theater, Venus Cabaret Theater, in which you performed that. Uh, uh, that segment from Two Pigs Fly. We'll get to that later. I hope, uh, hopefully, you could perform that for us I've today. I got it queued up for you, Trudy. I've oh, got awesome. it queued up for you. <laughs> Yay! Oh, that's so wonderful. That is very, very. <laughs> we, we really enjoy that because it's so relevant. And um, um, let's let's discuss that first. So, Two Pigs Fly. Uh, the entire show is about the. Is about what because we heard that segment and what inspired the uh, um, Mark. Uh, let's see, Mark. Uh, Mark Waldrop. Waldrop. Uh, Howard Waldrop. Crabtree. Yes. Howard, mm -hmm. Howard Crabtree uh, was a mad, crazy, wonderful actor, mm -hmm. and then turned dresser. And he loved sewing and creating costumes and looks, and he became famous for it. They put to show, uh, together a show, Mark and he, I think they did Lacage together, the original Lacage at the Palace Theater. Mm. And uh, that's where I first met Howard. And um, they put together a show called whoop de doo And uh, that was kind of a, you know, a, a frothy kind of, here's our material let's try to weave it together and do you buy it and everyone loved it it was a a, a hit and then um they did when pigs fly and um it was you know this particular song uh, laughing matters there was a lot going on at that time it was uh i think it was in the do you remember do you know what what year it was uh, uh published or what what year the uh off-broadway show no no. I know they tried to revive it a few that. years back. Mm -hmm. They tried to revive it a few years back and they got mm -hmm. all the way to, this is Lacage. No, this is not Lacage. This is um, When Pigs Fly. They got all the mm -hmm. way to the final dress rehearsal mm -hmm. and something happened and they've got all these Bob Mackie costumes and I can't wait to see them someday. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they'll bring it out of storage and because it's a wonderful piece. And it's about the AIDS crisis. It's about everything. It's about uh -huh. what we're going through right now, COVID, um, discrimination, voting rights, it's just all the bad, it's all bad news and we've got to, you know, it's nothing to laugh at, but we've got to remember to keep our sense of humor. Yes, because uh, I did try to do some research on that and uh, I found everything else, but I, I, was, I wasn't able to find the Broadway show, so, and it did. It never, it, it never really made it to Broadway. It was a big hit off Broadway mm -hmm. and then it was supposed to come back I want to say uh, 10 years ago, and um, they rehearsed, they rehearsed, and something happened with some money, and uh, at the final dress rehearsal, it kind of all got put into storage units, and uh, uh, that's all I know about it, and uh, that's just rumor, too, so uh, I hope that those storage units are well taken care of and watched, and we get to see those Bob Mackie costumes someday. Yes, of course, and uh, it seems as if it's like it's a very uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, piece that uh, uh, audiences would love. Yeah, Mark Mark Walpen, Mal, Mark Waldrop and I mm -hmm. went to college together in yes. Cincinnati at the Conservatory of Music, mm -hmm. and I don't mean to veer you off in that direction, that's but that's really why I I started talking about. Uh, why we started talking about When Pigs Fly and, and Mark and I met in 1970, 
two maybe or three three at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music yeah. and um, and we got to do several shows together uh, the Wizard of Oz and um, uh, he was the wizard and I was the lion Jimmy mm -hmm. Walt was in that with us and uh, uh, who else Sherry Cucinata anybody else you would know Tom Biola Tom Biola was a munchkin and uh, yeah and um, uh, let's see, uh, I'll probably remember somebody later on. My mind's kind of waking up. I mean, anyway, <laughs> but uh, we met and then we moved to New York together. We were roommates together in New York City, moved there in 76 when, when we both got our degrees <laughs> and, uh, you know, both kind of were struggling actors, you know, slinging hash at Beefsteak Charlie's and getting office temp work and you know, uh, I did some makeup, uh, freelance makeup work because I had trained in school and met a few people and, and um, Mark uh, wrote, he, you know, people would ask him to write things for him or, or direct my act or what have you. Then he, he continued to do like Broadway show after Broadway show. He was in the original um, Lacage and, and uh, Grand Tour and, and uh, just all kinds of things. And um, but he also has a passion for writing and directing, and he's directed all five of my nightclub acts, which mm -hmm. we are working on a new one right now, which I'm taking back to my hometown in Northwestern Ohio near Toledo uh, for my birthday in June of this year. Mm -hmm. Wow, we look forward to that. Please share with us so that we could. Um, uh, you know, I think I might be telling you about this for the first time. We've never talked about this, and it's just kind of all kind of laid on the table right in front of me over the last weekend. So, uh, you know, it's this is scoop for you, scoop. Okay, oh, great. thank you. Can uh -huh. I ask you a little bit more about it? Was it a, a project that developed because uh, over the pandemic you had a little bit more time on your hands or was it a long-term uh, project that you had always wanted to work on? Well, it was my 50th year high school reunion. Mm -hmm. And uh, that just happened last fall and I, have been meeting with my a few of my best friends uh, in a, from my high school class every Saturday at six o'clock for a Zoom for two years. And um, I I am an artist, a visual artist, so I take you know screenshots and and at the end of the session, forty minute session, my desktop is full of pictures that I put in a pile, and then I go through them and in preview I make. Um, collages, I put someone's eyes on someone's mouth or, you know, I just make compositions and then I put them together in a scrapbook with music. It's usually of old songs that I've sung and, uh, or, or uh, Tony Bennett. And, um, and then I send them to him. So we've got quite a collection. And um, so anyway, I was, I used to, I sang a couple songs on there and they said, you need to sing at the reunion. I said, no, no, I'm so out of practice. I, you know, no. And they said, yeah, it's not bad listening to it th with an MP3 and, you know, like a Zoom situation, you know, I, I never thought that I would get into it. Although I did, I've done a couple funerals and, and uh, things that have been very effective. Um, anyway, I don't know why I brought that up. Anyway, um, oh, what was I talking about? Yeah, you <laughs> Your new show that's uh, that's coming up in uh, uh, for in June. Yes, yes. Anyway, so I said I would come back and sing at my reunion in September. Mm -hmm. I put together little, my little MP3s, and we hired a a sound system at the venue and got there. And no one knew how to turn the, the venue's sound system on, and uh, including the janitor, um, <laughs> and who brought a hammer, who brought a hammer to help us, and. Um, so we winged it and I, you know, punched a button when my patter was done. And when I had introduced the song, I punched a button and it, it was very freeing for me really, because uh, up until then, you know, having done many cabaret shows, you, you carry a lot of weight. Is it going to go right? Is he going to make his cue is, you know, is that cue going to, and this was like so freeing in a totally different level than I've ever experienced before and I I just finished it and I thought it is what it was what it was and everyone seemed to love it and I seemed to be present which was really great 
And I've done it a couple times since, and uh, I am more present. And uh, I thought that I would do this thing in June. They asked me to come back to the homecoming, which is where everyone comes back to my little hometown in Northwestern Ohio. It's a little mm -hmm. farm town called Genoa, Ohio, not Genoa. Don't try to ask for it at the turnpike stop for, as Genoa. They will not know what you're talking about. I've had friends do it. And, and they say, oh, you mean Genoa? And they said, yeah, Genoa. And um, so anyway, uh, we have a homecoming every year. It was a very, always great and pivotal in my summer. You know, school was finally over. You could finally relax. And um, so they've asked me to come back and do an act. And so I have done put together five of them with Mark, and I asked him to help me put it together. And I just recently, like two days ago, reached out to my musical director, Pam Drews Phillips, who's in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and she's going to join us too. She's available as well. So putting that together with a committee in my hometown and uh, going to be performing at the town hall in Genoa, which we've refurbished in the, the theater group in my hometown. And it's June 3rd is the opening night. And June 4th, we have a matinee. And if we sell good, we're going to do another one June 4th evening. And that's a special day because it happens to be my birthday. Um, and I, I, I didn't tell him when we chose that date, but uh, it's worked out that, you know, that's what we're working on and, and just started putting things together. It's so nice that I don't have to think about doing MP3s because I was starting to have nightmares about that. And, uh, you know, in a small theater where you don't know, you know, what's going on audibly, it's kind of scary. Well, when you uh, talk about putting MP3s and performing, it sounds a little bit like our radio show, but you added the video and the live component to it, because that's what we do. We, we talk. Exactly. Perfect. A perfect example. And, you know, this is great because you guys know what you're doing, but, you know, Frank is a, you know, a car salesman and just likes to work at the theater and and he's doing the best he can, but, you know, and so I asked, you know, early on that we really have a sound director and a light director so that we know what we're stepping into and I don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's, that is very interesting. Could you explain to us a little bit about the uh, fourth uh, person, right? The fourth person and- The uh, fourth how... wall? Uh, no. No, no, no. Actually, you know, the first person, second person, third person, the fourth person that, uh, you know, when uh, for your show, all of me is kind of like a, uh, like a little mix between not exactly first person, not a second person. It's like somebody watching and from the perspective, but then yeah. you're also yourself. I, that's why I wanted to you to explain it. Oh, to very me, interesting. I, yes. Yeah. No, all of me. Um, I did, uh, it's the famous song, and uh, I do, halfway through it, I show slides of the different characters that I played in all these shows. Mm -hmm. And it shows all of the different sides of my being and my creativity. And, you know, I didn't even think about it till right now that I could, at this point, even include some watercolor portraits mm -hmm. in that. Up in, I did it 10 years ago, and uh, so we're gonna have to get to busy on another, uh, uh, PowerPoint display, you know, but um, it's interesting because I start out talking to the audience about, you know, what a, what a gift it is to uh, be creative and to get these words that have been interpreted many, many times by many people and go for the honesty and that usually works. And, uh, and then to connect with an audience, you know, if that happens, you're really lucky. Um, yeah. Yeah, because the, well, yeah, yeah. the reason I asked was that um, it seems as if uh, the way that you worked all of me kind of ties into the, the, the show that's coming up in June. There's that, there's oh, that. yes, it does. Yes, it it's does. It's, um, it's, uh, it's the Genoa Homecoming, and mm -hmm. my show is called Coming Home, and um, Bill Nolte on Broadway, and I have an opening number that we've done that we put together, and it's, uh, you know, the, the famous uh, vamp, bum, bum, ba-da-bum, bum, ba-da-bum, bum, ba-da-bum, bum, 
They say the neon lights, but I come in, bump, 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 bump. There's no business like show business, like no business. And it goes back and forth between on Broadway and show business. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's going to be the opening number. And they've asked if they could get the um, students involved. And I'm all for that. I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. But once again, I can't be thinking about the sound system and the students in the back bedroom making too much noise. And, you know, it's just, uh, I can't. So I said, maybe a little brass ensemble you know give me a drummer give me uh, a good trombone player a trumpet maybe a saxophone uh, and surprise me you know and uh, and start that bump ba bump with a nice little brass intro and and then at the end of the show take me out with it so we're trying to get the kids involved I'm doing a fiddler on the roof uh, yeah. medley and you know the kids would fit nicely into that but you know that takes work and rehearsal and I'm not there and, um, you know, we'll see what we can come up with. I hope it's uh, smooth. Mm -hmm. Yes. When you rehearse the, uh, the priest uh, at the, with uh, Joni and Farid and Sparrow for the confessional, how, was, how did that rehearsal? Was it in person or did you have to do it uh, via Zoom uh, during the creative process? No, that's very interesting. Um, you know, I've sung on several of their albums and, um, uh, their uh, shows that they do down in New York. And uh, um, I was coming out to Palm Springs in 2019, uh, around Christmas time, to start a production of The Ballroom, um, a Michael Bennett musical uh, from years ago. And uh, I was gonna stop in Chicago and see Joni and Sparrow and other friends, Don and uh, uh, Craig. And um, she said, you know, I'm working on my new album and the confessional you're perfect for and you wanna record. And I said, absolutely. Any time that I can spend time with you and Sparrow, we got to rehearse and then we got to record. And they were kind of like, it kind of went into one. So I got there, right? Be this was before, before pandemic. Now this is like, oh. Christmas right before everything shut down in March, you know, mm -hmm. so we were very uh, able to enjoy each other in this city and the neighborhood and I love the neighborhood and Southport and, and um, uh, I, I always have to go to Marie Sather, is it Ann Sather's or Marie Sather's? The, uh, there's a, there's a pancake place there or something that I got to get a breakfast roll from Ann Sather's. Marie Sathers. I don't know. Anyway, I'll, I'll um, get back to you. <laughs> I can Google it. Anyway, it's not important. Um, anyway, yes, I stopped in and we, she told me what she was looking for. I, I think I had watched a couple specific scenes and movies to kind of get, you know, there's always been a fascination with me about, I'm not Catholic. So, you know, whenever I went into a Catholic church, you know, that confessional always like, oh my God, I want to go in there. It was just fascinating. And, you know, to find out that my, my friends would go there once a week and talk to the priest and, and, and confess their sins. And, you know, I thought, I thought that discipline was really, really interesting and fabulous. And when, and when especially when I was a kid. And um, so to play that other side of the door was interesting. And, you know, the hypocrisy that we all deal with and, and just the, uh, there's not really a, a black and white answer, you know, a yes or no answer to these really big questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's give our listeners a little background. Joni Pilato and Bradley Parker Sparrow are uh, uh, recording artists, musicians. Uh, Joni usually sings, but <laughs> one time I saw her play the piano. And uh, Bradley Parker Sparrow is uh, a composer and piano player. <laughs> but one time we saw him sing. So you'll never yeah. know. <laughs> And they are also they also run uh, uh, Southport Records. Um, how many rehearsals did, did it take for it to come out so well? Uh, the confessional was it? How many how many takes? How many takes? Think? How many yes. takes? Yes. Um, well, that's very interesting because uh, we would work on the beginning, mm -hmm. and we would talk about the mood and the atmosphere. 
and we'd give it a try and then Sparrow would listen to it and Joni would listen to it. And I tried to stay out of it. You know, it's like, I can't listen to myself and make, make decisions. And then I think we would probably do each one. There are probably like six altogether or seven, you know, little uh, blurps altogether. And I think we probably did uh, between two and three takes on each one. So that's, you know, seven times 21, 21 little takes. And then they edited it all together. And um, yeah. So yeah. Wow. it sounds it sounds so simple. Well, you know, you're a sound person and it sounds so simple and the editing is so important. And uh, yeah, it was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it was wonderful. I, uh, we heard it and then, oh my gosh, <laughs> I thought if, if only I could interview you and then now we're here. Uh, <laughs> so that's awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, since uh, you sing so well, how did you first dis discover that you could sing? Because you did mention that, that you found out that you could sing. Yeah, I did. I, um, my grandmother sang. My grandmother was very pivotal in my life and uh, growing up and she sang in the choir at church and the church you know was very important in my life it was uh like a family to me you know and um so watching her sing and then getting to sing in the the young person's choir and and uh i did i i had a little discipline problem in uh, grade school with the music teacher we didn't quite see eye to eye and uh, I think I was just naturally talented and bratty. I don't know. I don't know. But we just, you know, he pushed buttons in me and I pushed buttons in him. And he usually was laughing. We made each other laugh. But anyway, um, I decided that I wanted to go to college and that it probably wouldn't be a good idea for me to go uh, into anything um, vocal, you know, choir or anything in high school because I would probably get straight Fs in conduct. So, um I decided that singing was not for me. Choirs, uh, nothing. I, I was a tuba player. I played the tuba. And um, I tried to get involved in um, starting a, a theater program there. We did our first musical my junior year. And my senior year, we did our second musical. And actually, we got a theater built on my uh, high school, like my freshman year there. So I never really, really thought about that. But um, I think I was in like one of the first classes to break in the theater. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, what was it? Was I talking about? Um, how you uh, discovered how to sing? Uh, how sing. how you, sing, you could sing? Yes. You're right. You're right. You're right. I went off to art school. I went to art school. I wanted to be a painter all through high school. I took art lessons at the art museum in Toledo and I drove up there every Saturday morning at 10 in the morning at a class and I was always really upset that my friends got to get up and play in the woods or sleep in you know but I had to get in the car with my grandfather and drive up to Toledo which was like an hour away and he sat in the car and listened to the Detroit Tiger uh, baseball game and I went in and, and took my art lessons every Saturday for seven years and uh, that sort of formed my uh, visual talents. And um, then I went to school, went to college, dropped out of college for various reasons, uh, art school, um, complicated story, but I had to drop out of my first year of college. Uh, I got the flu or something and um, had to miss classes so I dropped out of the class and that's when I said you know I've always wanted to sing and it's not been in the right place at the right time I'm going to take a lesson so I looked in the phone book and I found the Bach Conservatory Music music studies in the yellow pages and uh, Bach was early in the uh, alphabet and I called and uh, just said I want to take a voice lesson and this was in 1972 maybe, and, um, uh, or 71, actually the year I graduated. Um, anyway, uh, they signed me up for it. I got all the way to the front door and chickened out, went back home and called them. And I said, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't find parking or something. I just, I just was like, so petrified. So I said, okay, they said, okay, we'll put you down for next week. And I thought, oh my God, okay, let's just get it out of my system. So I went up 
and and just decided to let it let it hang out. And my teacher was very Robert Harless, uh, who's since passed, but um, he was from Toledo and and Florida, and uh, he was very encouraging. And I started doing things for him at his church and his theater group, and transferred my major to uh, uh, music, music at Bowling Green State University. And then I transferred to the Cincinnati Conservatory. And then I moved to New York in 1976. So it kind of all kind of fell from, from that, you know, dropping out of art school in 71 and kind of opening the door to, you know, I've always thought I could sing. Why don't you just explore that? And then being an actor too helped, you know. Mm -hmm. What was uh, your teacher's name that uh, that was encouraging? Uh, Robert Harless was his name, and he was from Toledo and and uh, also Florida. And um, yeah, he was a, a, a beautician, actually a hair person, who also used to be a singer. And um, I think he sang with the Toledo Opera, and and uh, then just started teaching voice and. So that's how I met him. So, um, so all that you know about uh, about singing, such as breath and posture and uh, and projection, and did you learn it from him, or were there no, other teachers that? No, 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 no. I think I think early teachers are kind of you know just take me by the hand and and just you know sing and like what's coming out, like mm -hmm. yourself. Yes. It's okay to be here. And then you, you find a teacher that asks you to do breathing things that you're really not familiar with. And, oh my God, I've got a diaphragm down there, but <laughs> I don't really understand how it works, but who, yeah, I can make that go in and out. And, and then, oh, try to do it while I'm singing. Yeah. Oh yeah, I get it. And then what tension in my jaw, you know, and, and I taught for like 20, 20 something years and um, loved it, but it, it's really hard work. It's, it's hard work to, uh, you know, because you expect your kids to do the work with you and, and they're all trying to survive. And uh, so uh, I haven't done it in a long time. And um, yeah, and that's, uh, but then no, I, I finally had several teachers and Franklin Benz at the Conservatory of Music. I shared a locker with Kathy Battle, Kathleen Battle. And she was there when Joni was there too. And uh, Franklin Benz was her teacher and my teacher and, and, uh, uh, anyway, um, I, I never really learned how to really sing until I got to New York City, and I was a textile designer. I got out of the show business and was a textile designer, uh, nine to five. I got a regular paycheck. I got insurance for the first time. That really made a big difference in my life, and I could see a shrink and um, I, you know, uh, and I could take voice lessons. And I found a teacher that I used to sing on Sundays at churches in New York City with a, I was a ringer, they call us. And um, Jackie Pierce, I think was the, uh, the and Ann Bynum was the, the, the uh, they or organized all us ringers. And uh, anyway, I heard this guy sing at like, nine in the morning, all these high seas. And I said, wow, I want to study with you. And uh, do you teach? And he said, yeah. So I started studying with him and I studied with him for like three years. And that's really when I put uh, my technique together. I learned the basics of what my body feels like, why I do this, why I have this posture. Um, and then later on, I was able to add, you know, audition technique with Sarah Lazarus and Alex Rybeck to that mix, you know, to learn what my body was doing in front of people and, you know, and where my eyes were looking, were they looking in the camera or are they looking way out here and no one can even really see who I am when I do that, you know? So point of focus was interesting and uh, put that all together. And I've just been in the right place at the right time and had a nice career since 1976. I became an equity actor. And I don't know how I got down this tangent, but I hope you're okay with it. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> lots, of, lots of information because uh, it's very fascinating how, how well you sing. And uh, I just, uh, we're just really interested in uh, uh, seeing how, how that developed. So the teachers that were major influences with you for, for your singing 
not all of them like afterwards were uh, at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. It was just uh, like uh, the, the, what, the, the teacher that uh, sang the high seas in the morning, uh, that, that was in uh, a choir, right? Uh, yes, that was in New York City, and, and he, he taught on Jane Street in the village near HB Studios, which is where I studied acting every Wednesday night with Stephen Strimpel. Um, you know, you just had, that was my grad school, really, was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the late 70s into the early 80s, you know, studying voice for a little while. I took voice lessons every day. I would get up and get, I used to think I couldn't sing before noon. So I started taking voice lessons at nine in the morning, just mm -hmm. proving that you, if you have to sing at nine in the morning, you get, you better have your instrument warmed up and know your instrument and, you know, sing at nine in the morning. So I would go down to the village from the Upper West Side, have my lesson, half hour lesson, go to work. They would let me get there at, I think, 10 mm -hmm. and um, work eight hours and then go on with my day, you know, and mm -hmm. it was, it was tough, but I, I, I made it through. And then mm -hmm. I finally got back in the business in 1981. Mm -hmm. I got back yeah. in the business. I think that uh, when you were uh, working as a, a textile designer that uh, during those years, you really enjoyed it too, because uh, otherwise, how could you keep at it? And then it, it uh, opened the door for your creativity as well, because you did win an award, uh, the Tommy Award for a textile design that you created that was, uh, it seemed like some kind of uh, flower with that. Uh, the, anther the Anthurium, yeah. Yes, Anthurium, exactly. <laughs> that was one of the first designs that I did uh, for Concord fabrics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I inched it along and took a yes, yes, do that and put my own stamp on it. And then uh, I left them and uh, then later on in the uh, Women's Wear Daily or something, some newspaper that came out, it might've been Women's Wear Daily, um, the, Concord, the uh, Tommy Awards were announced and my fabric was up there. So I was thrilled. I mean, I didn't get like a trophy or anything, but um, you know, it's in the record books and uh, I got, I ordered a bunch of the fabric. So I have, you know, lots of Hawaiian shirts around the country of friends and family. And uh, yeah, that's a very pleasant memory. Do you know if um, there were any uh, um, uh, costumes or, or, uh, or uh, let's say uh, uh, <laughs> creations uh, designed with your fabric? It's funny you should ask, but I did see one of my designs in Fredericks of Hollywood in like a stripper, you know, negligee. Uh, it was tropical flowers and flames and red and everything. It looked fabulous. I was so honored. I wish I would have said, I probably have it down in my, one of my scrapbooks, but I was just, when I saw it, you know, out in, and I think I even was out in Hollywood uh, working at the time. And I went to the store and saw it in the window or something. And uh, I was just so touched that uh, it made it to Fredericks of Hollywood. Uh, do, uh, do you know about Fredericks of Hollywood? Oh, I think that yeah, they're, uh, they have something to do with, uh, uh, high-end apparel, <laughs> right? It you got it. You got it. High-end apparel. Yep. And uh, they've been around for a long time. I mean, mm -hmm. 50s and well, probably around 60s and 70s, they kind of started showing up on the back of, you know, comic books and or uh, newspaper ads and things like that. And yeah, it's great. Memories. Well, uh so um, in your scrapbook, is that from uh, some magazine article that you found it in? Or because at that time there weren't cameras that you could just take a picture of the, the, the design in the window? Um, no, I don't think it was a, uh, it was a um, newspaper article. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah. No, okay. no. Something like uh, maybe- I think it was a catalog. I mean, maybe ah. I could go back and-, and and see the catalogs from Fredericks of Hollywood in mm -hmm. uh, probably that would have been 82 mm -hmm. because 81 or 80, 81, I think it was. I, I, sh I should do that. That's, that's a great idea yes. with all my free time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, that was in 81, 82. And then uh, uh, you, you debuted in, well, you, uh, your career took off when you uh, joined Cats in 1985. 
So what happened between uh, 81 and 85 that made all that uh, magic happen? Well, um, I met the love of my life and who I've been with since 1983. We met in Agonquit, Maine. And um, I actually got cats in 84, I think. And uh, I, I joined the first national tour and uh, in Washington, DC. And I was with the first national tour for about a, a year. We went to Washington, DC, uh, Philly, Chicago, and then I was transferred to the New York company. So in 1984, I made my debut in uh, the Broadway company of uh, Cats as Old Deuteronomy. I covered Old Deuteronomy, and, um, which I had been covering on the road too. And um, it was a nice, the nicest gig I had ever had in my life for sure. And it was nice to, it was nice to travel. You know, I enjoyed, I've had a real great family of friends to travel with and some money to stay in a nice hotel if I wanted to, or save, which I, you know, tried to save, um, which you always did because you didn't know where your next job was coming to from, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> and then cats I did for uh, a few years, came back to it, did a little bit more. And then, you know, haven't done it since. And I thought, you know, I'm finally at an age where I'm an old Deuteronomy age. And I really think I could sing it well right now. So it's like, I haven't done it any of these new ones, you know, so I hope to someday either direct a production of it. I, I haven't even thought about that or be old Deuteronomy, De Deuteronomy in a production of it. Is there nice. any, um, like, uh, any little segment of uh, old uh, Deuteronomy's uh, performances that you especially like that you could share with us now? Um, let's see. Well, let's see. The moments of happiness we had the experience but missed the meaning an approach to the meaning revives the experience in a different form. That's, I can't believe I remembered that. Oh, but anyway, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. that's sung uh, after an intermission signing autographs on the tire, uh, which was challenging, which would be impossible now with COVID. Even, you know, being out in the audience and everything right now, cats really wouldn't work. I hadn't thought about that, but, um, you know, theater is going to come back, though, in a new way. And, you know, there's going to be all these theaters across the country that are trying to hold on. And, and uh, it'll be uh, a new invention, I think. So right now, theaters are able to open because if you're going to have to uh, mask up, there's no way that uh, uh, actors could perform, right? It is, uh, they're still closed. I know that I see that there's uh, the cabaret shows and then there's something, but well, all, all that makeup, all that, uh, I probably it, is open, right? I don't know how they, uh, how they manage it's, it. It's challenging. And the picture that, you know, we see out here on the news, mm -hmm. you know, what have you. Um, I remember when it happened back in March and they said, oh, Broadway will be back in by July, you know, six months, six months. And then it was like, July came, I was like, no, it's not back. And then, oh, by Thanksgiving, no. And then by the next new year. So at the beginning of uh, 2021, things kind of opened back up. And then things kind of by the end of the, the summer, early fall, really were open. And I, I, I finally went to the theater for the first time. I saw a Company. I saw um, Carolina Change. Uh, I saw some great theater. I saw about five things uh, flying over sunset. And uh, then Omicron, Omicron hit. And, uh, you know, I was, I have been, I got my first uh, vaccination uh, a year from like yesterday. You know, I was one of the first ones to get in and uh, learn how to juggle that, you know, application thing online and keep submitting, keep submitting, keep submitting until you get an appointment. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I, I'm totally, uh, vaccinated and boosted and uh, but you know it's uh, it's a challenge 
That's mm -hmm. a challenge. Do uh, actors get any uh, like the PPP loans or any of the of the government help? I know that there was a there's a group that that uh, uh, that that asked for donations to uh, to uh, you know provide uh, people in the. I, I don't really know. I'm sure there are some uh, government things that help. I know the Actors Fund yes. has always been there when I needed it. And uh, I wouldn't hesitate if I was an actor, professional actor, to call the Actors Fund and say, I need a therapist, I need a support group, I need a job in something other than acting, you know, um, career transition for, for uh, dancers. And, and there's all sorts of help if you just ask for it at the Actors mm -hmm. Fund. That's, they always get my donation at this time of year. Good information. Thank you. So how did you get your first gig ever? Um, I'm going to say first professional gig. Okay. Um, it was senior year in college, and I drove to Indianapolis, Indiana, from Cincinnati. I think it's probably about an hour and a half drive, and it was an all-day affair. It was for Robert Young was the producer and uh, it was for Showboat with Shirley Jones and Gail Gordon and Ron Huseman. And uh, anyway, we uh, auditioned for it and I and, uh, got home. And by the time I got home, they had called and I had to stay for a dance call and, and uh, uh, read some lines. It was an all day affair. By the time I got home, I found that I had made it into the, the uh, chorus and uh, had a couple small roles. And that was in 76. So I was able to move to New York City after graduating senior year, doing Showboat, and then going to New York City with my equity card so I could go to equity auditions finally. Well, finally, it was I just got there. And then that show, actually, we went out to LA with it. And... Um, and uh, did we? No, that was something else. I'm sorry. It was just a summer gig. It was just a summer gig with Shirley Jones and uh, Howard. Did you, um, uh, did you include some showboat songs in uh, All of Me or some, uh, some of your uh, uh, nightclub acts when you did those uh, 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 operations? I don't think so. I don't think that I have sung anything from showboat. No. It's like all I heard women even, but I'm not sure. <laughs> this uh, you you have such a uh, doing research uh, about your career is uh, very uh, uh, challenging because you have so much you you've done so much. <laughs> it's one it's wonderful, but I enjoyed it, and I'm still going to uh, continue um, uh, exploring your work because I really really enjoy it. Thank you. When um, when you mentioned that the uh, Lori Beachman when she played Isabella and she had to stop the show because she saw that an attendee was having cardiac arrest, do you know if that uh, guest turned out okay? Very interesting. I know that we were all um, I was in the Cats chorus at the time and we were all on a microphone, four of us above hovering above the orchestra stage left behind the tire and Lori was out getting ready to sing memory. And uh, so we could see it on a little television screen. And uh, so we're listening, you know, and getting ready to sing our do -oo oos and everything. And, and she goes, stop, stop, we've got to stop. And we were like, oh no, Lori's having a, a, a seizure or, or a, a, an attack or something. We thought something is happening. And she said, something's not right. We still didn't quite understand what she says. He, he's, he's, he's not, you know, he's having, he's having a heart attack or something. And so finally, the, uh, everything stopped and the ushers went down to the person and everything stopped on stage. And um, uh, I don't think anybody got out and entertained. I think, um, you know, I think maybe the orchestra played a little bit, but um, very soon they had pulled the, uh, I think it was a woman, and they had pulled her out into the lobby. And uh, 
I think we heard that uh, she lived and she got taken away in an, in an ambulance, which we could hear come and park and then zoom away. And uh, we continued the show. Uh, you know, we don't ever want to, you know, have to refund any tickets, you know, mm -hmm. um, which leads me to another story. So the, I think the lady did live, but another story was um, we used to decorate, everyone used to decorate their uh, dressing rooms for uh, Christmas. And the booth, uh, which is where the four uh, singers um, sing, we decided to decorate and I put up twinkle lights. And one night I put up twinkle lights and a staple went through the light and blew up the, the light board on cats. I mean, it just caused all the lights in the whole theater to come down. My little staple, which I didn't know I didn't know at the time, but my little staple kind of threw out the the main or something like that. And um, they didn't know it until they did, you know, exploration like the next days ahead, what had happened. But uh, that's what they think it ha happened. So I, you know, I felt very guilty about that and don't tell anybody. Um, but uh, they finished, we finished the show with follow spots after, after, uh, I think it was about memory, but the whole rest of the show was, you know, finished with follow spots so they could at least you know uh, I think Grizabella and I walked off you know a door to the heaven heavenly side layer you know but um, uh, you know crazy things have happened on stage you know I was doing Jane Eyre in um, La Jolla no it wasn't La Jolla it was on Broadway and it was uh, uh, a revolving stage and I had to be on a bed after having my neck attacked and everything and come out this like panel of doors in the bed, you know, with a bloody neck. And then Jane came over to me and I made it to my cue, laid down, sat back and we went out and my headboard tore a, a part of a set off on top of me. I mean, I watched the whole thing and I don't really know how I made it out without something falling on me, but I didn't. But I think they had to stop the show because, you know, it was scary, but I, I, uh, I lived through it. And um, yeah. You, well, you were meant to, uh, for greater things and to uh, <laughs> <laughs> be a gift yes. to, to, uh, to uh, uh, theater goers and art lovers. <laughs> wow. That, that is dangerous. And um, as a lot of theater says, you know, uh, it seems as if, uh, uh, they they have to improvise to make it work for every show. So so there's uh, always that uh, that that unknown element because it hasn't been tried before. Yeah, you got to work out the details. You know, mm -hmm. I also did. Now that we're on this subject, I'll make it brief. Um, a Christmas Carol done at Madison Square Gardens. Uh, it was ninety minute show. Let's do it five times a day and make all the money we can. It was the first year of it. Mike Ockren, Tim Rice. Uh, 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 Alan, um, anyway, um, we were do starting the tech rehearsal and I started the show rising out of the grave, singing, uh, oh, the years are passing by my friend, digging a grave. And I would come up on a hydraulic lift. And so that was like the beginning of the whole show. So I'm laying down, you know, I had to crawl out on my cue to crawl out and look up at this empty hole up here. And they said, Bill, stay off the lift right now. Let's just watch it go up. So I got off and I got off to the back and I watched it go up. And somehow it didn't fit and it tore the, uh, the set up in the middle. It, it, oh. it stopped the show. It stopped our tech rehearsal for like a day and a half, which, you know, you don't stop tech rehearsals. But it was, it was, and I was like, I mean, I was right there, you know, I view with it. So it was like, it was traumatic, but um, I think we all went and had a, a, a Bloody Mary brunch or something because we couldn't really get back on the stage until they did a lot of even reconstructive things. So crazy things can happen, even at a tech rehearsal, you know. I think our tech lasted like a week and a half on, on that Christmas carol. It was very technically involved. They must have known that it was, uh, there was something that might go wrong, so they, did, they asked you to not uh, stand on the lift yet, right? 
Oh yeah. Oh well, yeah. No, they, you know, sometimes that backfires, you know, and they they try something without having tried it first, and people fall from you know great heights because their harness wasn't checked first. So now they're very very careful, you know, and um, it's uh, you know you got to work out all the kinks in these shows, you know, it can't be left to happen happenstance, you know. Is it OSHA that oversees uh, these kind of sets, uh, theater sets? Yeah, yeah, OSHA makes sure that, that things are safe mm -hmm. for the actors and for the stagehands and even the people that paint and everything, you know, right, right. it's the stagehands union and um, uh, actors equity and the musicians union. They all have, you know, certain standards that you have to, you have to make or we're not going to, we're not going to send our members there, you know, so it's, it's good. Mm -hmm. I see that you play multiple roles in a lot of shows. And uh, earlier, you said that you were in uh, the chorus, in the chorus, while uh, 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 Lori Beachman saw that the uh, the uh, young lady was having a heart attack. So um, you also, so you play Old Deuteronomy, and then you also uh, played in the, you also sang in the chorus as well. Yes, I, there's a a, a position. Um, of four singers that stand by for Grizabella. So there's a soprano or a belter, you know, in the cat's chorus. There's a Deuteronomy cover, which was me, baritone. And there's a Gus Growl Tiger uh, and uh, the Pirate Cat and a Bustopher Jones um, cover, which is the tenor. And then the, the Gumby Cat and uh, Jelly Lorem cover, which is the mezzo. So there are four singers that are ready at beck and call. And I got to tell you, I never really understood why they had them there on beck and call until one night I was watching the opening number. We were singing the opening number, watching the thing. And I see old Deuteronomy kind of slump down and crawl off the stage, you know, and it was like, oh, my God, I better go down there. So I ran down, ran across the stage, ran up the stairs to the stage manager's office, say, you're on. And I had been on before, but. I like to do makeup. And when I first was given my cat's makeup by Candy Carell, the designer, Candace Carell, um, it took me like two hours to do. I mean, I got into every highlight and groove and glitter. And, and, um, and then I had to go on and I got it down to, and that was like close to two hours. And then I got it down to just at an hour. I just got it. I could do it an hour. You know, I'll get there early. I don't mind. I can get into character. Well, I had to be on in like 10 minutes. So I had to get upstairs. I think it was right across the hall from the stage managers, get my costume on, get my makeup on, get in the wig and be ready for my first entrance in like 10 minutes. And my mind, you know, was, I'm just going to have a nice leisurely show singing in the cat's chorus, you know? And I did that um, and I made it and I got my makeup down to 10 minutes. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and even faster when, you know, that day, but mm -hmm. I uh, learned how to, you know, really, really isolate uh, the eyes, isolate everything and get it done. And um I was I really saved the day many many times on Broadway that year, and uh, I think that's why they initially and they ended up offering it to me, uh, mm -hmm. the role of Deuteronomy, and so I ended up doing mm -hmm. Deuteronomy for a few years, a couple years actually. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting. But, um, so when you did that makeup, it's so fast. So did you have to uh, eliminate some steps and highlight some steps? You knew it so intimately that you could. You could figure oh, yeah. out how to do 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 it do many many shortcuts, but still create the effect. That's it. That's it. You just got to know which ones. I don't really need to bother with that. And and mm -hmm. um, this these are really important. And the angle I get them at is really important. And you know, put the highlight on and blend the highlight now. Don't come back to it. Blend it now. And mm -hmm. and um, you know, it was it was pretty easy to break down. Then you know. Mm -hmm. And when you. Uh, I first to learn about makeup was that uh, at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music did they teach you that over there or where did you learn learn it yes. and then oh. yes I uh, I didn't know and my, I mean I was clown white I mean you just put clown white under your eyes and you were good to go 
Um, and, but, but then I went to the conservatory and the first year that I transferred there, uh, a lady named Lena Roskowski trans, uh, landed in, in Cincinnati. She was Russian and she worked for the Moscow Film Academy or something like that. She was trained mm -hmm. and they hired her. The Corbett's hired her to teach a makeup class. And I was in heaven. Mm -hmm. um, I really, I really, I mean, I worshiped her and my, it was like probably one of my favorite classes that we did. And, and so I learned through her and then um, I would go off and do a job in Lake George and they could see that I could do makeup, my own makeup. And they said, would you mind doing, you know, the male chorus as Chinaman? And I said, no, sure. So then I got asked to come up to the Canadian opera to help them um, with their makeup and wigs for their season. And, um, you know, so, and then I also got an interview at the Metropolitan Opera um, through Italo Tayo, who was a, a mentor of mine at school. And I had to make a decision whether I wanted to really pursue that path, you know, of being a makeup artist, because I would have to just close the door to performing, singing, acting, everything else, and just concentrate on that. And I, I, I couldn't do it at the time, you know, I couldn't make that decision. So I turned down um, a lot of things. And um, now, you know, I, I get a role like Fagin, and I have a blast. I have just a blast working on, on character roles. And uh, what are some other crazy ones that I've done lately? Fagin and uh, uh, Milis, uh, not Milis, uh, Marcus Lycus in uh, Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. I've had a ball doing makeups. This is WZRD Chicago 88.3 FM. And we have with us at WZRD, Bill Nolte, actor, singer, uh, performance coach, uh, multi-talented artist, not only a watercolorist, even uh, your, art, uh, your, makeup, uh, your makeup skills, uh, Bill, that, that is truly an art because it, it, is, it's difficult. it seems so difficult to me. And then you, I, uh, I saw the video in which you uh, uh, made yourself up as a fig and uh, you know, really, really fast. And I think you, did you mention that it only takes you about 20 minutes to do all that? Yeah, it's, um, you know, half hour is usually your, your, your time to come to the, you know, your makeup station and, and get your makeup on, get your, you know, right undergarments on, get your costume on last because you don't want to get it dirty and, mm -hmm. and then get your wig on and hat, you know, coat. It's, there's a whole stepping order to it. And, um, you know, you don't want to get to the theater way early. You know, so I usually get to the theater an hour early, no matter what. And if the makeup is involved, I, I address it. But I try to get my makeup uh, about 20 minutes. You know, I start a whole process of, of uh, a wig cap and, and um, a base and taking out my eyebrows and um, preparing, you know, to get any kind of crud where the spirit gum is going to go. But those are all, you know, thought out ahead of time and, and laying there in front of you very, very clean. I mean, keeping things, you know, you know, lace clean is a big part of it too. Maintenance is a big part of it. And I learned that from Lena in, um, in uh, Cincinnati. And um, yeah. So you mentioned that you could, you also could, you know, you could have uh, been a makeup artist for other actors. So um, how is it that some actors, so some actors just don't know how to do makeup. So uh, they would need someone to help them. But uh, for actors that have been trained uh, well, like yourself, then uh, those actors would, uh, would know how to do makeup. Or, or is it kind of more expected that uh, if only uh, actors could do their own makeup? I think it's pretty much expected that, that you need to do your own makeup. Some mm -hmm. people are naturally, you know, adept at painting their faces. Others just don't get it. And I understand that it's, it's a talent. Um, if makeups are involved, uh, the theater would best hire someone to oversee and possibly do the top 
most complicated um, makeups. Um, but, you know, most regional theaters right now can't afford a makeup department. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, you know, Google, Google. <laughs> you know, if you don't know how to do makeup, you know, simple corrective makeup, you know, theatrical makeup, you Google it and it, you know, you look at your bone structure, where a highlight goes, where the shadow goes under the cheekbone, you know, at the forehead, you know, you sculpt the skull and, and, um, but it's like, uh, actors are very inventive. Now they want to look good on stage. So uh, they, they will be Googling. You will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's, um, so when, uh, so if you were to over, if, if they had, if you had been hired to like oversee makeup, and then, uh, so you would be helping people do makeup or would you be someone like a teacher and then teach the actors how to uh, do their own makeup so that they could do it on their own? You, because you said that uh, there, uh, there was a lady, right? Uh, Candy Carell that taught you the makeup of cats. I don't, I don't know if I yes. remember. So she's, she's, a she's a makeup designer. Mm -hmm. And she was also the makeup artist and designer for the David Letterman show forever. That mm -hmm. was Candy with long blonde hair. She's lovely. She also did cats. Um, I went away and um, I remember I did a production for the Michigan opera of um, Madame Butterfly. And the, the head makeup person there um, taught us all and I caught on, I, I understood it. And she saw that I did. And she, as a friend said, would you oversee this? And so the next day, you know, everyone kind of sat there and I said, okay, put your hair in little rubber bands here and here and put a wig cap on and then cover your face in white. Now powder it, give it a spritz of water, you know, um, uh, just everything you had to do in the the Asian uh, base. And then I would probably have gotten there early and done my own eyes. And I would probably have them swing by me and I would do the eye, do the eye, and then mm -hmm. they would do the rest. Because mm -hmm. it's sometimes hardest to do your eyes, mm -hmm. first of all. And they're the most important feature, you know, uh, the eyes and the eyebrows. And uh, the angle, you know, is it angry or is it dopey? Dopey is like this, and angry is like this. And, um, you know, everything then, you know, angry is like this, and dopey is kind of like that. Oh. And, um, you know, it's all, uh, all about sculpting the face and shadows and, you know, your base color and all of that. Mm -hmm. Interesting, very interesting. Um, when um, I watched you uh, as a uh, old Deuteronomy, it seemed as if uh, there was that um, uh, air of uh, Bert Lahr in there. So uh, then I found out that you uh, did play the Cowardly Lion and the Wizard of Oz. So did you study uh, Bert Lahr before you even uh, did the role of uh, the Cowardly Lion? It's funny. Yeah, it's funny you ask. The Wizard of Oz has been an important part of my life, still is. Um, but we did The Wizard of Oz at school, Worth Gardner directed. Oscar Kassarin was our musical director and, and um, Tom Biola was a munchkin. And um, anyway, uh, I think at the time I did do a little heavy Burt Lahr uh, research. I was a mad Burt Lahr fan my whole life. And um, of course, iconic, you know, uh, wizard or in the Wizard of Oz as the lion. I think I did have a, a maybe an unhealthy amount of Bert Lahr in my uh, my. How old was I? Twenty year old? Night? No, nineteen year old. Uh, nineteen twenty year old. Uh, Cowardly Lion. Um, I've since gotten to do. Uh, uh, not wicked. I'm, I'm auditioning these days for wicked, and but uh, the the uh, stage musical of Wizard of Oz, out of the Sacramento Music Circus with Gwen Casal, and that was a that was a joy to play the man behind the the mirror and also uh, the professor, 
And uh, uh, that was not so much, well, that was a different character. That was the wizard. So uh, I kind of was older and mature and I kind of made up my own kind of uh, wizard. And uh, it's interesting now I'm auditioning uh, for Wicked. Um, one of my, we call them self tapes these days. And it's this process that actors are asked to put themselves on tape and it's a royal pain in the ass but we do it and um, it's part of being an actor in these COVID times and uh, you know you got to keep a sense of humor about it and um, so anyway I recently did one and when you sent me your first uh, communication with wizard in the title I thought how did she know I just had an audition for the wizard? I, it was funny. And then I said to Joni, I said, did you tell her? And she says, no, that's the name of their studio. And, or, you know, anyway, we laughed, but um, um, I, this, this role, the uh, wizard is quite intriguing, I think. So mm -hmm. it's nice to be working on it again. Yes, absolutely. Well, good luck with that. Hope, uh, let Bye. us know if you uh, get it. Thanks. Awesome. Um, what is it about, uh, if you don't mind, um, just uh, concentrating a little bit more uh, on Bert Lahr, what, what was it about, what is it about Bert Lahr that uh, interests you so? Uh, his heart, you know, he had a tender, tender heart that you've got to see um, because he was relaxed enough and goofy enough and wasn't afraid to let us in to see his heart, you know, a, uh, a softer, weaker um, color, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what I love about him and, and his sense of, you know, just abandon and, and freedom and uh, in his pain, there was always so much heart mm -hmm. and pain, you know, mm -hmm. and that appealed to me. I don't know why, you know, but I, I love him. Yeah, well, that uh, relates to the best of uh, human nature. Maybe uh, that's, uh, that's what um, uh, uh, you, you, you aspire to, and that's what you respect, and that's what you love, so that uh, appeals to you, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So, um, that, so from your study of him, that, that was him, and uh, that, uh, that kind of... Uh, helped him be uh play the cowardly lion so well because it was actually part of himself as well i think uh, we're just having a uh, uh emergency alert uh, practice no worries <laughs> I, well someone's calling i'm loving me. it yeah. don't you worry don't you worry yes, we <laughs> yes. i don't think Here, let me just take this call yeah. fine don't worry hello. about me hello okay awesome nothing urgent i think it was just uh, um uh, a spam call uh because of this um alarm and then phone call at the same time here it comes again here let me have okay okay Hello, this is from UCID. How can we help you? There isn't any. I think you uh, called us before and we don't. Uh, what? Who, okay, hold on. Uh, what the department are you calling? What? Uh, who, whom are you calling? Okay. Oh, okay. So that is us. Could you call us later? Because I'm in the middle of a live interview right now. Okay. All right, that's good, thank you. When did you meet Joni and Sparrow as, as you know, while we're not on the subject? Uh, uh, I think um, it was uh, her, uh, my original plan uh, debut uh, 
uh, CD release party. Uh, oh, so it was recently. Recently. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I thought you've known her for all her albums. She's done so many albums, you know. Mm -hmm. No, I love all her albums. Yeah. Yes, yes, I, uh, I also, uh, we also interviewed her on WCRD, and uh, and um, when I did the research uh, on uh, her albums, uh, that was so enjoyable. I enjoyed those yes. a lot. Yes. Yes. Uh, when you, um, when you, uh, so you keep in touch. When she's working on a project, she would uh, kind of. Uh, uh, talk it over with you and uh, talk to, talk about it when you get a chance when the two of you have some time and a, a chance so that then you get to follow what she's doing as well yeah you know um over the last 30 40 years you know i'll just there'll be a package and a cd in the mail and it'll be this is my new album this is my uh, new, my new album this is my new cd and i've got a whole you know uh folder of her CDs that I put on and and just have a Joni day and um, I have my favorites in each one and and um, um, and then like I've sung on about three of them and uh, it's usually when I'm in town on tour I've been in Chicago on tour with cats at the Schubert theater and uh, then I was transferred into New York and then I was also there with uh, at the Airy Crown. Do you know the Airy Crown Theater? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's still there. Is it still there? Yes. It yeah. Is. Mm -hmm. I was there with uh, South Pacific with Jane Powell and Howard Keel back in '78 or '79, and then I've also been there with the producers. At uh, is there an auditorium theater? Maybe not. <gasps> there is because uh, yeah. I I haven't been to those venues yet. I thought that the Auditorium, the McCormick Theater, or something. It's the same as the auditorium. I have to, I have yeah, to try, sure. but it is there. Yes. Yeah, we we played, we played at uh, some theater, some mm. big theater. It wasn't the Schubert. Mm -hmm. Wow. When you were hired to perform on the Seaborn Spirit Cruise Line, and you had to do uh, two one-hour shows. Did you create uh, All of Me and on Broadway at that time or was it earlier? And then you just pulled those two shows to, to, uh, to perform on the cruise line. Um, when I was doing the producers, mm -hmm. uh, I closed it on Broadway for like the last year and nine months. And then I was you know, off for like two weeks. And then I was transferred to the Las Vegas company which I stayed with for the last probably year and kind of fell in love with Vegas actually at that point. Um, that was like 2008 when everything kind of crashed, but I bought a place out there to live in while I was doing the producers there. And I mm -hmm. still have that. And that's my retirement place that I hope to retire to someday. Um, uh, but anyway, um, what were we talking about? I'm sorry. Um. The Seaborn Cruise Line. Oh, Seaborn Spirit. So, our, yeah. So Seaborn somehow, Spirit. <laughs> somehow, Seaborn Spirit Cruise Line, uh, I got wind of them and um, I submitted, uh, I was working on all of me. Mm -hmm. And um, Mark Waldorf and I and Pam Drews Phillips had put it together for me to do uh, in Vegas at the uh, uh, Flamingo Library, I think, as part of their arts. Um, session um and um uh anyway i just got a call here i gotta decline it um we put that together and did it and it was a big hit and i put a little uh cd or a little dvd promo of it and i sent it off to a agent in england who was casting for seaborn spirit cruises and she said they're very interested at the time, <clears throat> 2008, they were looking for magicians or, you know, sword swallowers or one person, you know, puppeteers. They didn't want anybody with a band. They didn't want anybody with a piano player and a combo. They, they wanted one person on stage. So when uh, I sent them um, my concert, they said, well, if you can come with just you, you know, no, no musical director, nothing, just have all the charts and everything, our band will play for you. 
And so, okay, but you need another show. So we quickly put together on Broadway, um, you know, it, it usually takes about 16 songs to put together uh, a nightclub act. And uh, so we found 16 songs that we had been working on and we had done in other shows, other like five other shows that we had worked on together and uh, some other Broadway shows that I had done in the meantime. And um, we put together two one hour shows and went out on tour and uh, it was challenging because um, it's important to have a band that um, is with you mm -hmm. for an hour. And this band, you know, really, uh, it was challenging, uh, but we got through it and uh, uh, had a lovely time. I would go back on a cruise in a minute. I loved cruising and I loved doing my two shows but I, I would think I would require that I had a musical director with me, maybe a combo. It's impossible to do it with, you know, people that pop in to a, a, a orchestra and then go off and, you know, kind of a challenging situation. Yeah, exactly. Because you need uh, people to understand you uh, and uh, understand your music, understand the whole show. And uh, yeah. they really can't with just like uh, reading a, a sheet music and then trying to accompany you. No, my, my, the first band that I got, they had never heard of Fiddler on the Roof. Mm -hmm. And I went to my cruise director, I broke, I stopped, stepped out of the audition, uh, the uh, first, you know, introductory uh, meeting. And I went to my cruise director and I said, well, we got a problem here. You know, the band has never heard of Fiddler on the Roof or Man of La Mancha. And I do big medleys from those two shows. And he said, well, I know a pianist that's on board. Maybe he can play those two Broadway, you know, you have charts for him. I said, yeah, I have charts for him. And so indeed there was a pianist on board. I can't remember his name. He was from England, lovely guy. He played, I asked him up, you know, as a guest artist to play those two uh, medleys for me. And um, we got through it, but it was, it was a challenging time. You know, that's, why I don't want to do it in June in, in Ohio. You know, I want to have someone there that's my support. Mm -hmm. exactly. It sounds like we're hearing whales in the background. Do you hear whales? Um, I like I like the idea. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have the uh, background here. It's like under I the see, I was wondering, maybe those are the whales, yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh -huh. there's construction going on uh, somewhere else in the building close, okay. nearby. <laughs> that was the first time I heard it. Mm -hmm. There's uh, also banking too. But uh, that 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 isn't as uh, <laughs> as audible as the wailing, and it does sound like uh, whales. So it's fine. Let's imagine that they are. <laughs> yes. Did uh, what else did uh, Dick Gallagher and Mark Waltrop uh, and you create besides uh, uh, when pigs fly? And they didn't well, really create it with you, right? They, uh, but they. No, I no. They they were just friends of mine. Mark uh -huh. was a friend from college, and mm -hmm. and and Dick Gallagher played uh, my Billsville. I did a act called Billsville, oh, yes. mm -hmm. and and Mark Gallagher or uh, Dick Gallagher played that. And he was a coach and a dear friend, and and uh, passed away way too early from the AIDS epidemic, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, they wrote Whoop de Doo together and a lot of uh, comedy songs together. And, um, you know, Dick played for Nancy Lamont. He played for so many big, wonderful pop, you know, uh, cabaret icons. And uh, he was just a pillar in the community and very sad to lose him and Howard. And, uh, you know, Mark has continued to write and direct more directing all kinds of uh, theater and cabaret acts. He directed uh, B. Arthur's cabaret act. He directed mm -hmm. Bette Midler's Broadway show act one year. Yeah. So he's been, he's been busy and, and he's so talented. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads us to um, uh, when uh, uh, Laughing Matters. Would you like to perform that uh, for sure, us? Sure, uh, let me see. From uh, when, uh, when Pigs Fly. When Pigs Fly, let me try to get uh, uh, speaker view so I can kind of see. Let me get my okay, music yeah. here. Okay. Yeah. Get this down here. 
All right. Yeah, these are some crazy times that we're living in. And uh, we've made it through them before. And we'll make it through it again. We just have to be uh, patient. Live at five and CNN keep us all abreast of breaking stories that contend to make us anxious and depressed. Problems with no answers hang on like some nagging cough. And every day some brand new issue rears its head to piss you off. Bad guys win. Optimism's wearing thin. Things are spinning out of control. Cynicism's all the fad and world events can make us mad as hatters. Almost every day, some underpinning slips away. These aren't laughing matters. Time bombs tick. People keep on getting sick, and a nickel's not worth a cent. Wickedness and greed abound, and just as peace is gaining ground, it shatters. Hate is here to stay, and justice goes to those who pay. These aren't laughing matters. The truth is scarier by far than anything that Stephen King could write. The stories in the papers are a daily small decline and fall spelled out in black and white. What to do? How to take a brighter view when your noodles totally fry. Human spirit needs to be leavened with some levity. So take those blues and bounce them off the wall. Keep your humor, please. Cause don't you know it's times like these when laughing matters most of all. Thank you so much, Bill. That's classic. That's so beautiful. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I think I heard the whale. Be singing a duet with me and I loved it. I, I can't wait to hear that in person. Yes. Oh, my, oh my goodness, it's so it's so relevant. Um, so at least we have uh, if we don't know the exact year, then it was during the uh, uh, when when AIDS appeared on the scene one day uh, when when it was written uh, about yes. that time. Yes. Oh yes. And we so all we all were battling through, you know, losing all our friends mm -hmm. in the uh, 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was 89 and, uh, you know, people were sick working on this, you know, mm -hmm. I think Howard was, was failing towards the end and, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a very, you know, challenging time to live through just like today too, you know, you just have to buckle up and stay strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, despite it all, uh, um, artists such as um, uh, Howard, he was able to create something like this that's uh, that's uh, so universal and it's so uh, it seems as if it could uh, withstand the uh, test of time. It seems as if it were here uh, since the beginning and uh, it, it it will it will keep on it will persist. Yeah, but yes, it even will. though it's sad, it's so it's so still so beautiful and I love the way that the uh, 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 laughing matters was uh, portrayed in the beginning, but at the end, 
laughing matters. It's not just laughing matters. Yeah, matters. that turn mm -hmm. is is quite magical, and yes, it kind of sneaks up on you, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, it can it can get a little sad, and then it's like, no, we're not trying to be sad. We're trying mm -hmm. to just say, you know, you gotta have a sense of humor in this, mm -hmm. and look for things that bring you joy and things that uh, tickle your fancy. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, your, uh, your painting, uh, watercolors. Um, uh, so you've been doing this even before you started acting. Uh, let's. I so you know. So now we know that you loved doing art. Uh, ever since you were very very young, was it watercolor that you started with, or was it some other art form? Um, I think I was always sort of, you know, I could draw beautiful eyes and, you know, big boobed ladies, you know, with the big boob, the big line here and. And uh, I could draw beautiful cars and trucks and everything. And I think in fourth grade, um, the art teacher came by and, and said that we were going to do watercolors for everyone to, you know, grab a National Geographic and pick a picture, a picture that you wanted to, you know, duplicate. And um, I did. And I don't know, it just instinctually, it just came out of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, there was this thing called Scholastic Art Awards, and my teacher entered it, and I won first prize in watercolor painting, I think. And I was like, whoa, that, you know, I was not even thinking about that, and that's good, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe it. And um, so I kept painting. My grandmother was very encouraging and, and, you know, always saw that I went to my art classes on Saturday, and always had a, you know, an oil painting set there if I wanted to oil paint or watercolor or what have you and continued education. And she was one of the first uh, teachers graduating from the Bowling Green State University in Northwestern Ohio. So she was very much into educating kids and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, teaching. And um, that was my yeah, grandmother. Yes. Oh, so. So it's in you, um, the the teaching and the and the art. So that's yeah, the kind of yeah. where yes, and it's in a family, in your family. Yeah, and I've been continuing with it over the uh, uh, the pandemic. I've been studying with a, a teacher from Vermont, Brattleboro, Vermont, Tony Connors, watercolor methods, and I take a class once a week. Uh, I have for almost a year and a half now, and uh, took a little time off for the holidays. But it's a two hour class and he gives us assignments to study brush strokes or trees or color or winter landscape or fall landscape, summer colors, you know. And um, so it's kind of been the only kind of purpose I've had this whole uh, pandemic that and self taping to like nowhere because you send these self tapes out and like you never hear whether anyone got it or whether you know it's okay anything so it's been frustrating i have my first in-person audition this thursday in new york city in over two years so I'm, i i set it up just really just to get back in the city i'm staying outside of the city up the hudson river and um at a, on a lake we have a house on a lake and uh just to go back and see what it's like and see if people are you know, taking it seriously and wearing masks, which they should be. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, see what I think I sort of miss, but I don't probably really sort of miss it too much. Just in-person auditions. I just want to mm -hmm. say hello. Yes. Well, good luck with that. Good luck. Thanks. Um, the self-tapes, um, how do you record that? Is it with a camera or is it with, your, with a phone on a tripod? They... Um, expect you to have video skills, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you're encouraged to buy a, a background that folds out. It's round. Mm -hmm. Mine is gray on one side and like a slate blue on the other side. And I can fold it up and 
put it in a round, you know, a big round black container. I leave mine on the wall because it's a it's a hassle to to fold down and fold back up and everything. Um, and then you're encouraged to have a ring light, which I have three of them. You know, I bought a Barbie ring light for the Barbie doll size, the first one, and it was like, what am I going to do with this? And so then I bought another one, and another another one came with something else that I bought. So I've got three. I've got one super duper one, big, and I uh, I film with my uh, iPhone. It's got a really good camera in it, and always horizontal. And 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 uh, I put it in the ring light. I sometimes have a uh, my MacBook Pro right next to the uh, camera, so it can I can play a tape of someone reading with me. But you have to you have to record scenes that you have to you know leave a space to read with. And you have to do your research. And um, they send you things to sing with, which are rather mechanical, and that's challenging. But um, you know, it's a lot of work. And uh, you know, I I have a lot of respect for people that that do it because it's hard work. And self tapes uh, started after the pandemic, or uh, yes, because of the pandemic. I think they were around kind of lurking before a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. we want to see your uh, scruffy face, send us a little self tape of you reading this scene in a scruffy face or, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you're the right age or not. Can you send a, you know, a little blurb of you talking to the camera, you know, uh, but, you know, since the pandemic, they're, they're all the rage for TV and film and commercials and everything really. Mm -hmm. And um, I I think maybe even some in-person auditioning has been going on, but I'm so naive that I don't know because I would never go to one. Uh, but I'm going this week, so we'll see. I'm going to wear a mask the whole time, and, um, and I'll probably take it off to sing. I'm going to see what the uh, vibe is there. It's down at, uh, I think, 890s, not 890 Studios. No, that's, that's a slip. Um, it's down at 8th Avenue Studios, down on 8th Avenue in the 40s at a big old famous Ripley Greer or, or something. I'm not even sure. It's one of the old so, rehearsal places. Oh, so it's a, it's a new, uh, you've never been there before then? Oh, no, no, no. Years and years of going there. It's just I haven't been in two years, you know. Uh -huh. but, no, it's been around for long. There's like, there's like three or four audition rehearsal places around the city mm -hmm. that Ah. That, uh, you get real used to, you know. Okay, so that that means that um, uh, different uh, uh, shows go there to uh, uh, hold the rehears hold the rehearsals. Yeah, some uh, some so some shows will you know rent out a whole floor of a rehearsal studios uh, or uh, mm -hmm. rent one you know near where their producing offices are or what have you, depending on the location. Um, you know, yeah. Either they'll either use them for auditions or for rehearsals. Mm -hmm. When um, you, when you won that Scholastic Art Award, was it your teacher that submitted for you? Oh yeah, I never would have. I never would have known. I never would have had the courage, you know, the uh, chutzpah to do anything like that, you know. And when I when I won, it was like, oh my god, you know. I'm just from a little farm town here and I'm in a, a national scholastic magazine. I just, I couldn't believe it, you know, and mm -hmm. um, it felt good. And it kind of, you know, made me want to stretch farther, I guess, you know. Well, uh, it seemed as if like, um, uh, judging from that, you were uh, self-conscious before, but you, I think like when you're an actor, then you have to uh, tread the fine line be, uh, between being self-conscious and uh, understanding, you know, how you're performing and then also being uh, uh, fearless and then uh, just uh, uh, doing it and, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, you know, just uh, <laughs> uh, getting into character. So how, how was it for you to bridge that, um, br bridge uh, being self-conscious to being self-aware and being so uh, great a presence on the stage as you are now? Good question. Um, I think I've always been a goof. And even like, you know, the senior class play and the junior class play books and crook 
tricks. I played a, a, a thief who breaks into a high school and they hide the, the uh, principal who I look like in a closet and I come out in disguise and run the school as the thief, but I look like the uh, principal. So it wasn't too, you know, but I loved making people laugh. It came pretty easily to me, um, you know, just look for the honesty and uh, stay out of your own way. Don't try to add too much to it. You know, it's usually, um, if it's well-written, th the scene usually works. You don't got to add a lot. Uh, but then the other character choices that you have to add are fun too, you know, and what comes up while you're rehearsing, um, working with an inspired director that can say, you know, I've never thought of this before. You read it today, but, you know, try it as a, a loser this time. Or this time, try it rather than being so sad. Try, try it, you know, it making you hysterical, like laughing, like this is so absurd. So, you know, the ability to try different things, opposites. But I think the real thing is to get to the heart of things, the honesty of the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, opposites is always a good thing too. If it says I'm sad, it's usually you're not acting sad. You're doing everything but acting sad. You know, trying to mask the the idea that you're sad. But uh, yeah. Well, you mentioned that uh, you were a goofball when you were young, and then it seemed as if uh, being an actor, you were able to being the goof that goofball was actually. It seems a, a talent with you, but uh, when you finally uh, became a very good actor, it seems as if you used the, uh, the goofball side of you to your advantage. Uh, so was it on a kind of, uh, you, you just mentioned that uh, uh, you're trying to um, find the honesty. And then perhaps when you were a goofball, you already saw the honesty, but you didn't, uh, you didn't uh, understand it, but you, you understood that others did not um, did not understand the honesty. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, um, life in the 50s and 60s was pretty brutal. You know, it was pretty uh, middle class and working class and, and uh, you know, going to college was a big dream that I knew I had to do my, I just, you just did it. I mean, that's what you did. You went to college and I probably would have been a teacher. Um, most of my friends went to college at Bowling Green and then uh, kind of stayed in the area. And I, I think I was all set for that. And then I discovered singing and that took me to Cincinnati, you know, and, and that was the big city. You know, at first when I grew up in Toledo, Detroit and Cleveland and Chicago, Chicago was the big city, you know, to get to mm -hmm see Chicago and that's where I want to live that's where I want to live and then I went to Cincinnati and New York became the big city you know I had friends down there that oh you just graduate from college and you move to New York that's just that's what you do if you get a degree in opera or musical theater if you want to you know continue a performing arts career you just move to New York and I was like really wow and then you know uh, I would see friends that were living there I would go in and stay with them for a long weekend and see like 50 shows in like three days you know in those days, you could. You could see an early show, a, a Broadway show, a late show, then an after hours show. And we filled every moment we could with seeing theater. You know, when, uh, let's see, The Wiz was then. And uh, the first show that I saw on Broadway was Pippin. And I had a choice to see Pippin or uh, Seesaw or A Little Night Music. And I chose Pippin. And then the other two were like, things that I really wanted to see, but I never got to see it because I didn't get there in time. And then I got there and Pippin ran for many years. And, you know, I saw it like at least 15 times more because I got free tickets and the fellow Michael Rupert uh, sublet my, my roommate's uh, bedroom a year when he was doing Pippin. And, and it was like Pippin became really, really part of my life. And it was the first Broadway show I ever saw. So, you know, Pippin and Cats were instrumental, you know. And Waitress was the last show that I did. I just did that two years ago. And um, that's a, you know, an old man with a sense of humor and, you know, a heart of gold and, you know, very, 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 very wise, mm -hmm. honest. Mm -hmm. well, uh, did you know the story of Pippin before you chose to 
uh, go see Pippin uh, over the other ones? You know, I think I did because I think it was one of those albums that we played. We played all the time when I was in school. We played um, Pippin. We played I Got Love, uh, Melba Morris singing I Got Love from Perley. Um, what else? Oh, uh, Angela Lansbury in Dear World. We played those albums nonstop. And Chuck Man Jones, Land of Make Believe. I mean, that was on nonstop at, in college. Um, it's so funny. It's so funny that you uh, brought that up for me. But those were the those were the the musical theater albums that we listened to. Mm -hmm. You know, we would sit around. You got to hear Melba Moore sing "I Got Love," and. Uh, it was funny. Read it at least 20 times during my college career. Wow. That's an endorsement. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, we, got, we got to bring those back. Yeah. Uh, when you mentioned that um, uh, for painting, that the eyes, uh, you love doing the eyes. So did your um, skill with doing eyes and uh, your, your per perspective, your understanding of uh, drawing eyes help you as an actor because uh, uh, I did see an interview uh, that, uh, in which the interview words said that you do uh, wonderful eyes in your acting and you do. Yeah, maybe it's all kind of, you know, um, related. You know, eyes were one of the first things that I, I think I mastered and um, Eyes have always been a really important part of my makeups as well. I enjoy, you know, choosing colors, choosing eyeliner, choosing treatments. Like what we said, the angle of the uh, brow and the eyeliner determines so much about the character. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you know, some eyes don't need to be really, really black lined. You know, they can be smudgy, you know, or or sadder or... or uh, more colorful, you know, so it's all in the eyes. So it's um, uh, it, it's depending on the character, the way that you do the makeup then. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So when um, uh, Candy was teaching you about the uh, about how to do the makeup uh, for that character, did uh, when they when she teach, does she take that character into uh, account as well? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, she had to do, you know, 20, 25 different characters in Cats, you know, and, and um, you know, she had the uh, T.S. Eliot book of cats to read and each cat had its own personality and then she had to choose which colors, you know, represented each cat and, mm -hmm. you know, Old Deuteronomy will never wear bright yellow, orange, red, blues, you know, he'll be all in grays with like a, a, a mystical pearlescent rather than silver or gold, you know, and, uh, you know, just different rules. Oh, she, she thought it all out. She came with all of the, 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 uh, everybody had a menu of, of what they had to do steps they had to go through to start their makeup. And, and, um, and if you caught on, you know, you, you, you had to catch on. I mean, there was no if about it. You had to have your makeup on and be down in the wig room for your three minutes of sitting down, having your wig prepped, having your ponytails here to pin into, having the nylon on, your costume on, your makeup on, into your costume, blend it up so that the wig will, you know, and then the wig person would plop it on, pin, 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 you're out. There, you know, two, two minutes in the wig chair. And then if you had to, you'd go and you'd just touch up a little, little skin that was showing, you know, make sure your hands are, are covered and uh, then it should be time for places. Well, it's, um, it seems like a very uh, stressful, but you enjoy it and then it doesn't seem as stressful anymore. You know, it, it does seem stressful when you look at it and you know it was stressful for a long time and you realize that what's the worst that can happen and you know what i lived through last fall uh for my reunion of singing with the sound system kind of giving out on me and you know having to 
resort to pushing a computer button and singing with a tape. That was a real uh, eye opener for me about releasing control and being here right now and being honest and, you know, looking at, you know, Alice and, and getting things from Alice. And you do that with a, an audience for sure. Um, sometimes you can see individuals in the audience and, but most of the time it's just the audience is a presence that you're talking to or reacting from or trying to hide from, you know, if you're angry and, you know, but the audience is definitely someone that you, that's in the equation with you, you know? Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, they're the other side of the equation. <laughs> yes. You mentioned that it takes you at most two hours to do, to do a painting for a painting. Um, so, uh, and then some of them you do really fast, I think you said, but then how long does it take for you to do a contour drawing? Because you don't lift your pen much. Well, I like to, I love doing contour drawings and um, a lot of my sketching for a painting is a contour drawing. So I try to keep it quick, depending on the subject, you know, a, a, a tree will have many, many contours that you're gonna be looking at and not looking at the paper, but looking at the tree. Um, mm. But, uh, you know, a contour drawing should be quick. It shouldn't be real studied and slow and methodical. It should be, you know, what's your eye looking at and what's your hand doing? And, uh, but, you know, it can, a watercolor painting can get overworked really easy. And so there's a term in watercolor, in all painting, a la, pre, a la prima, a la, you know, the first time, get it right the first time. Don't go back in and add three steps more put that mist on the ridge in your first brush stroke with a wet into wet wash and then float some, you know, sepia in there to give it a glow, you know, get it right the first time rather than having to go back in three and four times. And um, so I had a teacher that said, you know, you should be able to finish a painting in two hours. So that's, you know, sometimes it takes me an hour. Sometimes it takes me an hour and a half. Um, so far, I was working big. I was working half sheets and whole sheets and quarter sheets of watercolor paper. Mm -hmm. And um, I now, uh, this teacher has, has got us working, you know, eight by 10, nine by 12 size. And I've learned a lot by making, taking my scope down and realizing that I can use the same techniques and the same value studies and uh, contour drawings, everything, but on a much smaller scale and learn a lot, twice as much really, because I'm, I'm paying attention, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so what you're saying is that when you uh, scale it down, then you have to, uh, uh, there's not that much room to, uh, for, for, for unnecessary. Uh, yeah, there's, there's less, less room for error. You know, this big thing, you've got a lot of room for error and a lot of, you know, area to cover. Down here, you, it's like you don't have that much to cover. So you want to try to accomplish your goals. You have to know what you're, you know, you're after, uh, the edges you want to keep, the edges you want to make soft, um, washes that you want to put in. Uh, are they a graded wash, you know, starting intense and then fading out? or are they just all light blue? You know what I mean? And uh, are they wet? Can you float, float a cloud of something into that blue wash? So, you know, it's all, it's all technique and uh, trusting, you know? Do you think that you would have uh, been uh, so good uh, at makeup if it were not your, uh, your love for art and your training for art? Because the way that you're describing how you paint, it, uh, it kind of resembles what, uh, what you described when you were talking about makeup. I think they're definitely um, related. And, um, you know, I think that uh, right now I'm getting a lot of satisfaction uh, with my watercolor brushes. And there'll come a time when I'll get 
satisfaction with my makeup brushes again, you know? And uh, uh, so brushes have played a big part of my life, both on stage <laughs> and, you know, in the artist studio. That's funny. Yeah. Well, let's do a, a WZRD community assessment with you. WZRD Chicago, being a nonprofit radio station, must be responsible to the community we serve. WZRD is mandated to file quarterly issues with the FCC and non entertainment community focused programming. And we like to assess the community for these quarterly issue topics with three questions. First, what is most important to you? Well, I got to say right now that universal health care and prescription drug prices, just the whole uh, conveyor belt that we're on with uh, universal health coverage being something for the, the privileged and uh, not the middleman and the men on the bottom mm -hmm. having to work so hard for it. That just doesn't seem to be solving itself quick enough for my taste. I mean, I just think that everyone should be entitled to universal health care coverage and be able to go to the doctor if they need to and, and uh, not pay a thousand dollars copay for their, their drugs each month. And uh, that stuff happens. And we've heard about it from politicians forever. And I hope that we can make some ground, ground headway in uh, making it easier for the, you know, the common man and the middle man. Thank you for that. So, second, what long-term problem must we address? Uh, climate control. You know, I think that we are on a dangerous course, you know, with the storms that have happened lately and the temperatures that have peaked and fallen lately. And um, I just think that we can't go to solar or wind power quick enough and get rid of some of the gas uh, consumption and oil consumption in our, our uh, everyday lives. And that's why I have a, a Prius. Uh, I've had a Prius for like 20 years since they came out and uh, we'll continue to buy some sort of electric car because um, I, I think that, you know, anything I can do to help that whole situation. And I grew up, my, my dad ran a gas station, a Ohio gas station, Standard Oil gas station in Ohio. So gas and the fuel industry is a big part of my life, but uh, I, I can just see where it's, it's taken us and where it'll continue to take us if we don't start taking some steps. Finally, what problem must we resolve now? Oh, I think the hottest thing for me right now is voting rights and everyone should have a, a say at the table. And uh, I don't wanna get into a whole political thing because it's not what we're here for, but um, I think the, our elections, I've always believed in them and, and uh, you know, I've not been happy with a few in my past, but, you know, I accepted them because that's what a democracy is and uh, we move on. And I don't think anyone should try to uh, interfere with voting rights and the whole voting process, stay out of the way and let impartial people take care of things. Uh, speaking of which, thank you so much for that, uh, Bill. Um, uh, the, to Kill a Mockingbird, wasn't that uh, at one time at Berkeley? Did you have anything to yeah. do with that? that I one? didn't have anything to do with that, but my friend Dakin um, did. Uh, it's, it's on Broadway, and uh, 
it went away and then it came back. Jeff Daniels is in it. And I think it's come back and I think it's going to come back again after a little hiatus too. I think it's, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's going to come back. It's very successful. And uh, Dakin Matthews was the judge in that. And uh, he and I know each other from Waitress. We were both Joes in Waitress. Mm. Well, Bill Nolte, uh, is there any um, uh, contact information for uh, uh, our listeners? Oh, and by the way, that's uh, uh, since we have you here. Uh, so you uh, right now during COVID, you're not able to uh, uh, be to work as a performance coach, right? No, I've I've not really been doing that too much. Um, you know, someone will ask me to read with them for a, um, an audition, and that's usually I do it as a favor. And and uh, I really haven't been doing too much of the uh, the coaching, um, and that's been my choice. And uh, especially with the COVID, it's it's been my choice, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't really need to. You know, I'm I'm living comfortably on my pension and my social security and and uh, my painting and um, so hopefully you know that will continue and and there might even be some theater uh, in my future too who knows but if not you know I take it a day at a time and uh, I'll get to sing with Joni and Sparrow I'm sure mm -hmm. yes absolutely uh, well uh, if um, uh, listeners want to learn more about you and your work uh, where, where do they go I have a website, uh, BillNolte.com, and uh, you can leave me a message there at the end. It's contact me, my agent as well. I have pictures of my career, uh, all the different characters I played in, in my career, and I've got pictures of my paintings that are for sale. Uh, I've got pictures of my, uh, my, my resume, my headshots. Um, I've got media, I've got video clips of uh, different things I've done on TV, audio clips of recordings that I've done, and um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think that's it. I think I've covered all the bases, but it's, uh, it's something that I love. I love uh, keeping it up to date. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a wonderful website. When I did uh, my research, I used it, and then uh, it's, uh, it's beautiful. Um, did you did you use uh, WordPress or did, could you disclose that? I, I did. I used my friend Michael Yeshin Photography. Mm -hmm. I can't, uh, you know, recommend him enough. He's taken my my headshots for the last well since we became friends. We did Fiddler together in Florida, and he's been my headshot ever uh, ever since. Mm -hmm. He's taken like my last four or five different headshots, and wow. um, I decided to redo my website about maybe five years ago. And um, I asked Michael to, to design it for me. So he's uh, branched off and is doing that as well. But Michael Yeshin Photography, I highly recommend for website, online presence, um, branding. Uh, he's great. He's in New York area, he's in Jersey. And uh, he and his wife are expecting a baby. And um, you know, he, he's great, yeah. Well, my, Bill, Bill Noti, thank you so much for uh, joining us at WZRD Chicago 88.3 FM. We wish you the best of luck in your auditions and uh, in, in all your work. And, uh, and um, we'll uh, talk again uh, in the future sometime. Trudy, thank you for having me. And it was so nice to really get to know you. Mm -hmm. And uh, until we see each other again, the best to you. Thank you. Thank you so much.